And so, Lord God, I will rejoice in you and this simple gospel. But it does seem like something separated us. And I want to know you, uh, Lord, I do. So, Father, um, I think that's true of my friends here, too. Would you help us to understand how it is that we could know you? Because it seems we've ran into some problems in that department. (laughs) So, Lord God, would you preach your word to us in Jesus' name? Amen. Hey, uh, last sermon in Romans for a while. And uh, when you get to Romans, this part of Romans chapter 16, Paul is wrapping up his letter. He just presented, I think, the most thorough systematic theology in all of Scripture and told all of us to greet each other with a holy kiss. Um, And then it's like he's just compelled to issue this final warning. Okay, this is verse 16. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause div- divisions. Dicostasia. Dis is, is twice. Stasis is what is, or like substance in Greek. So it, it, dicostasia means that what is is divided from what is. Watch out for those who cause dicostasia, divisions, and create scandals, obstacles, contrary to or beside Beside the doctrine that you've been taught, avoid them. That is, like, divide yourself from them nicely. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own koya, belly, or possibly womb. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. You may remember that everything to seem to be uh, in, like, a beautiful state, a homeostasis, and the Garden of Eden, when with smooth talk and flattery, the snake said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She put it in her belly, and everything started to divide and die. Paul continues, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace, shalom in Hebrew, will soon crush Satan under your feet. So beware of those that cause divisions beside the doctrine that you've been taught. So Paul seemed to cause some division, didn't he? He says to divide, though, from the dividers. He's trying to divide from the dividers. Jesus caused some division, right? Don't think I came to bring peace, but a sword, he said. And yet he is the Prince of Peace, revealing the God of peace who will soon crush Satan, the divider, under our feet. Truth and love causes division in order that there would be no more division. It divides us from division. But don't we all just love division? I mean, seriously. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Nobody's going to be satisfied if there's a tie, right? There must be a winner and there must be a loser. And yet all the members of each team will say after the game is over, they'll say, well, it was a team effort. We won because it was a team effort. We lost. And if they don't say it's because it was a team effort, the coach will say something to them. We won as a team. We lost as a team. There, There are those that love football because they love to see members of a team work as one. Right? In other words, they love the communion. And there are those who love football because they love to see one team just, you know, torment another team. They love division. And I imagine that each of us is a little bit of both of those. Paul writes, beware of those that are in it for the division. 
And it might be worth asking, well, then what is ultimate reality? The division or the communion? Long about uh, 5th century B.C., the Greek philosopher Parmenides, he said, hey, uh, would you agree with me that what is, is, and what is not, is not? Could you agree to that? Could you? He said, well, if that's true, then what is cannot be divided, and what is cannot change. For if what is were to be divided, what is what is, or what would what is be divided by? Either what is or what is not, right? So if what is is divided by what is, and what is is, then what is is not divided. And if what is were to be divided by what is not, well, then what is would not be divided because what is not is not, right? Uh, therefore, what is cannot be divided, and what is cannot change. And so, if you're divided and you change, you must be what is not. Or I am not. Well, that's kind of creepy. And, and I am a little bit worried that um, what I am might become I am not. Common sense, that is my experience of this world, would tell me that I am, but I do change. In fact, I am worried that I might become I am not, for in this world it seems like everything dies. Anyway, the, the Hebrews, they claim that God is one, and he does not change. They said God is I am, or I am that I am, and yet God does seem to move with his people. In other words, he doesn't do nothing. Actually, God does everything that's anything, and he does it with his word. Solomon wrote, whatever God does, so he does something, endures forever, which is a crazy statement if you really think about it. Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing... Any taken from it, nor anything taken from it. And, and yet, common sense would tell me that I do do what God does not do, <laughs> right? In fact, my do-do is, is evil. <laughs> it was the early church that taught that I am that I am, that is, God is undivided and unchanging, and yet he constantly moves. For God is a dance of three persons in one substance called love. God's a trinity. One communion of undivided, unchanging, yet ever self-sacrificing persons. God is love, and in him is life. Life is homeostasis. Many persons in one substance, ousia or, or stasis, homeostasis. And Paul just wrote Romans 16, 17, beware of those that cause decostasis, division. But it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and we all love division. I mean, aren't we all trying to exalt ourselves? Aren't we all trying to glorify ourselves? Aren't we all trying to, to win? And isn't that because life is a competition? And so we believe that we're all being tested and judgment, judgment is coming, and so it's only natural to divide and conquer. It's common sense. In fact, isn't that what it is to be a Christian? And isn't that why we go to church to gain more knowledge of good and evil in order to make the right decisions, pass the test, win the game, while the losers lose and forever suffer? It's it's common sense. In seminary, I learned that American fundamentalism and evangelicalism grew out of Scottish common sense theology at Princeton Seminary somewhere around the turn of the last century. I don't know how true that is, but I do know that in America, in particular, the church, uh, uh, the American church has adopted the ideas of the Enlightenment in order to battle the Enlightenment. During the Enlightenment, people began to argue that the only things that are real are things that can be comprehended by us. In other words, known through common sense. So when the critics said, 
God is incomprehensible to us a few hundred years ago. We began to say, well, we can comprehend him. And if you're smart, you'll be able to comprehend him too. If you're smart enough, you'll take more knowledge of good and evil, and we're going to help you take it, so you'll choose correctly, pass the test, join our team, enter the kingdom. It's just, it's common sense, common sense. During the Enlightenment, the world said, life is the survival of the fittest. And you know, that's really nothing new. It's just dressed up with big new words and called science. The world said life is the survival of the fittest, and so we began to say, well, we're the fittest. <laughs> and we're going to beat you. And that's actually nothing new. That's just human religion. It's common sense. We think life is beating our neighbor. Division. Rather than communion. But maybe common sense is nonsense. You know, if everything is comprehensible to you, you will find that nothing is worth comprehending. You may gain billions of facts, but none of them have any meaning. It's like gaining the knowledge of the good, but everything dies and nothing is worth knowing because all you know is evil. Well, Paul writes, the God of peace, Shalom, Shalom is a, communi a communion of, of many things in one thing, right? A homeostasis. The, the God of peace will soon crush Satan, the accuser, the slanderer, the great divider, under your feet. How bizarre is it to argue that what Paul really means is that there will be an endless division between those who win and those who lose? Between those whom God saves and those whom he refuses to save, or they refuse to be saved. Between those for whom he is a blessing and those for whom he is an endless curse. How bizarre is it that we have called the proclamation of this eternal division the gospel? I get that there is a chasm that the rich man can't cross. But we seem to forget that Jesus came to destroy every chasm. And that's not bad news. That's the good news. That's the gospel. So anyway, Romans 16, verse 17. I appeal to you, brethren, to watch out for those who cause divisions. Verse 20, the God of peace, of shalom, will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater. Don't know if I said that right. My kinsman. I, Tertius, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, in case some of you thought, hey, wait a minute. I thought Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. It's important to know that just like many in ancient times, Paul used an amanuensis, if I said that right. That's someone who dictated his letter and edited his thoughts and then wrote them down. Critics will often argue that some things attributed to Paul weren't actually written by Paul. And I think that for, for, for several reasons and for this one reason, the arguments are mostly silly. And that's be, because Paul often used an amanuensis. Anyway, next verse, verse 23. Gaius, who is host to me, and to the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus greet you. And that's where the letter ends, in some ancient manuscripts. But most manuscripts include this last paragraph. And this last paragraph has all the marks of a liturgical confession, as if the practice became uh, to read Paul's letter to the Romans in church, that someone would read it out loud, then everyone would say this uh, last paragraph. They'd read this together in the worship service to end the letter. And so it makes perfect sense to me that Paul may have originally sent the letter from Corinth to Rome in 56 AD, and then years later, having arrived in Rome, either in prison or now out of prison, he added this doxology, thinking to himself, Erastus and Cordus, greet you is hardly a great finale to my letter. It needs something more. I'll sum it up in a doxology. So this is it, verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel... That is the preaching, the proclamation of Jesus Christ, 
which probably also means not just preaching about Jesus, but Jesus actually preaching through Paul, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the apocalypse of the mystery, mysterion, that was kept secret in times eternal, but has now been disclosed, and also through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all the nations, the Gentiles, the peoples, according to the command of the eternal, the Ionios God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory into the ages, into the eons, through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a doxology. For it's a statement of doxos. Glory. Not given to us, not given to men, but given to God as worship. And in the middle of this doxology, which is revealed through the gospel, is this amazing word, mysterion, or mystery in English. I would suggest that we have such a hard time believing the gospel, the simple gospel. The simple gospel is just God saves. We have such a hard time believing the gospel and giving glory to God because something in each one of us just hates mystery. (laughs) You see, common sense is like the exact opposite of mystery. Mystery is not the absence of meaning, writes Dennis Covington, but the presence of more meaning than we can comprehend. The whole secret of mysticism is this, writes G.K. Chesterton in his book, The Romance of Orthodoxy. The whole secret of mysticism is this, that a man can understand everything by the help of what he does not understand. You know, every little child is a mystic. For no little child completely understands his or her father, but if they trust their father, he will help them to understand all things. Every little child is a mystic, and those that believe they have grown up are not. We've all been tempted to think that we are grown up and have no father. Scripture refers to mankind as a mother, and so we're all called the sons of men. And the Greeks referred to the earth as our mother, and that does make some sense because we're all made of dust, right? And we return to dust. The earth is dust, and our parents are dust, but we all wonder, well, is is there more to this than dust? God's not male or female, but he is called our father. To a little child, mother is probably most familiar, but father's a little more mysterious, We all wonder, where did I come from? My parents, yes. The dust of the earth, yes. But it seems that there's something in the dust, a mystery. The origin of the Greek word mystery, by the way, is a mystery. But by the time of Paul, we know that it had some powerful connotations. To the Greek philosophers, it referred to the realm of what is. (laughs) That mysteriously interacts with this realm. In this realm of shadows in which we seem to live and move and have our being. The realm of what is not. To the Greek people, it often referred to the mystery religions in which participants would go through these (laughs) mysterious rituals that reenacted the life of a god. The idea that that one is saved by communion with, with a god such that their story becomes your story. And so you go through these rituals. To the Hebrew mind, the Greek word mystery would have been closely tied to the idea of the holy. God is holy, and he abides in the holy of holies in his temple. And to all minds, Hebrew, Greek, and American mystery brings up a powerful set of questions. Where do I come from? (laughs) Why am I here? Who or or what is my source? 
And so Paul writes, God is able to strengthen you by my gospel, the preaching of Christ, Christ's preaching, the revelation of the, the mystery, the mysterion, kept secret in times eternal, but now made known by the command of God that you would trust. That's the obedience of faith. We don't trust because we hate mysteries <laughs> and love common sense. In other words, we all love the illusion that we are in control. You see, mysteries have to be made known. They are not knowledge that, you know, you can just take. Jesus uses the word mystery once in the Gospels, and I think that's largely because it's really a Greek word. He uses the word mystery once in the Gospels, and that's in reference to the parable of the sower and his seed. John uses the word four times in the Apocalypse, the, the Revelation. Paul uses the word 20 times to describe at least three realities that I think are really one reality that in my experience, very few people believe. So because of common sense, which is nonsense, we just don't believe the simple gospel. I can't fully comprehend or explain these mysteries. But we've been pointing to these mysteries for the last, last year and a half as we've been preaching through the book of Romans. And if you've dared to believe these mysteries, I think you might then just trust the ultimate mystery and actually do what God our Father is asking you to do, asking us to do. Well, the first is the mystery of time and eternity. Common sense, that is our experience in this world tells us that time is like an endless succession of moments that cannot be reversed or transcended. The Greek word for that idea is chronos. It's where we get words like chronology. And for the last several hundred years, we've been told by scientists that this is the only kind of time that there is. The universe is all that is, was, or ever shall be. Well, modern versions then often translate Romans 6.25 as saying that the mystery was kept secret for long ages, which we think of as a long time because that's the only way we've been taught to think about time. But Paul doesn't write long ages or long time. He writes chronois ionios, which literally translated is in times eternal. And that's why I've shown you this picture over and over again for 15 years and wrote a book on Genesis 1 titled The History of Time and the Genesis of You. I think this is how Scripture views time and how we've been told that we cannot view time. And yet even physicists are now saying, yep, that's time. A chronological time surrounded by eternity. Scripture, uh, the Jews, the early church, viewed time beginning to end as six or seven ages of chronological time, just like the days of the week, seven days of creation, seven seals, seven thunders, seven trumpets, seven bowls. But they viewed all of time uh, as six or seven ages of chronological time with this in, within this reality that Scripture calls eternity. Now, Sasha, I think this, is this slide two or slide one? This is slide one. Okay, so I kind of messed it up a little bit, but that's okay. We'll be all right. But in Greek, ion is a noun that clearly means age. Ionios is an adjective for which there's no English equivalent. So, equivalent. So, ionios has to mean something like of the age, and we translate that as eternity or eternal. In Hebrew thought, there are six or seven ages or days of chronological time, but another age is coming which is thought of as an endless seventh, something represented as sometimes as an eighth. That is a, a Sabbath that never ends, for it is the end, when and where everything is good and it is finished. Jesus is crucified on the sixth day, which is the day that God makes Adam in his own image. And he's resurrected on the eighth day, which is an endless seventh day, or better, the day that everything is filled with the end, who is the beginning, who is Jesus, the life, eternal life. 
And you see, that does not mean endless chronological time. But our liberation from time and all of time filled with eternity. In Revelation 19.5, a messenger that looks like Jesus swears an oath that in the days of the seventh trumpet sounded by the seventh angel, chronos will be no longer. It gets translated out in most versions because it just makes no sense to the translator. But the angel swears chronos will be no longer and the mystery of God will be fulfilled. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul writes this, Behold, I tell you, a mysterion, a mystery. We shall all be changed. We will not all sleep, but we all should be changed in a moment at the last trumpet. We get confused about when that is, and we come up with all these silly maps of the end times because we don't believe that it happened at the cross. And it's happening all the time, for Jesus is the edge of time and eternity. Now, uh, that was meant to be one. So now go back to the other one. Uh, oh, no, wait. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Okay. You see it, right? So, so Paul taught that the end of the ages, and this is in Hebrews and Corinthians, was the moment that Christ put away sin with the sacrifice of himself, that that's the end of chronological time. So eternity invaded temporality at the cross. Or maybe we should say that the cross just, it revealed that eternity is invading temporality all the time. Yeah, like that. Whatever the case, chronological time is the realm of what is not. Now you can go back to the other side. Even Albert Einstein claimed that space and time are a stubbornly persistent illusion. Chronos is a temporal illusion, <laughs> what is not. And eternity is the manifest presence of what is, I am that I am. Through a few just really crazy experiences I, I can't explain now, I've learned that Satan absolutely hates this chart. <laughs> and I understand why. Common sense would tell you that you must write your own story. The mystery of time and eternity reveals that your story is already written. And yet, you can write it and live it and maybe even dance it with God when you commune with him right now. The moment eternity touches time. The mystery of time and eternity reveals that in reality everything is good. And it is finished, which means that death and Hades are like an illusion in space and time. Revelation 21.5, death will be no more. Christ abolished death, writes Paul, and brought immortality to light. Satan traps us in death by convincing us that we alone are the author of our story. And yet that story is just an arrogant illusion shadow. In reality, there's actually no space for evil. For God is the creator of all that is, and all that he creates is good, and he creates all things with his word. And through his word, he's filling all things with himself, so in reality, there is no space for Satan. For all things are filled with I am. And that brings us to the second mystery, the mystery of good and evil. And that's why I keep showing you this picture. You've seen this picture so many times, right? Not because I like this artist. In fact, I even forget the guy's name. But because um, he's painted what I think Scripture so clearly describes. Common sense would say, that's impossible, that picture. How could all of humanity be staring at Jesus on a tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden? We've sent archaeologists to Mesopotamia. We found no garden of delight. I wrote a book about this titled God and His Body. I hope to write another one titled The Tree in the Middle of the Garden. 
In Romans eleven twenty five, 25, Paul wrote this, lest you be wise in your own sight, your own conceits, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, mysterion, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Common sense would say, no, sorry, <laughs> they just made some bad choices. The mystery says, no, it was God's choice. They've been hardened. They've been consigned to disobedience, and that's evil. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul calls this the mystery on the mystery of lawlessness with which the man of lawlessness, the imitation Christ, the antichrist, steals the throne in the temple and is revealed in his time. Lawlessness is a mystery because, you see, the law is God's will and God's word through whom all things are created and yet evil is that which God does not will and his word does not do evil is that which is not. So the good is what is and the evil is what is not. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 7, the angel shows John the harlot who rides the beast. And the angel says, I'll tell you the mystery. The beast you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the pit and go to destruction. In other words, the lawless one exists in the past, and the lawless one exists in the future, but is not now, which is the place where eternity touches time. The beast exists in your anxieties and your fears, but he is not here and now. In Romans, we learn that you are the temple, and in the depths of your temple, there's a garden, and that is the Holy of Holies, and in the Holy of Holies, there is this tree. It's on top of the ark between the cherubim. In Colossians 2, 3, Paul tells us that this is a mystery, a mystery that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You get that? In Christ are all the, he's like a pinata. In Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you see, on the tree, on the tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And yet also on the tree is the life, because Jesus is the life. He's our husband, and we are his bride, who maybe was a whore. And just like Paul told the Ephesians, this is a great mystery. And I'm saying it refers to Christ and his church, his bride, who was a whore. Well, the liar, you know, the liar tempted the woman, who is all of us, to take the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil to make herself in the image of God. Well, that's just common sense, isn't it? She saw that the fruit was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and a desire to make one wise. So she, what did she do? She took it. And everything died. And the Antichrist, her ego, was formed. For immediately, she began to hide in shame. <laughs> she was divided. It's utterly ironic, but by taking the law, we actually make ourselves lawless. <laughs> and that would make some sense, because this is the law. I know that his commandment is eternal life, said Jesus. By taking the life, taking the law, we violate the law. And that's what half of Romans is all about. The revelation that no one will be justified, made right by works of the law. The mystery of lawlessness. <laughs> what is not. But the other half of Romans is all about the mystery of godliness. What is. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness. God is what is. And God is a communion of love that is life. Right? life. Now put your thinking caps on, but I think common sense would tell us that death is the absence of life, as if what is might truly become what is not. But Christ died, which would mean the life died, and yet according to Scripture, Jesus has, and this is in Hebrews, an indestructible life. So maybe death is not the absence of life, but the division of life, for life is a communion. And so God the Son cried out to God the Father from the depths of our isolation, why have you forsaken me? He cried out, why have you forsaken me? But not because God is divided, 
but because each one of us is divided. And he has descended into the illusion that is each one of us, for each one of us has believed that we are divided from God, our Father, who is love. So this is a great mystery. What is was divided from what is by what is not. And yet what is not is not, which means the division is a lie. A lie which gets shattered by the truth when Christ, who is the truth, descends into us, confessing our sin, trusting our Father's grace, waking us from the nightmare in which we have imprisoned ourselves. Now, I doubt that I said all of that right or correctly. Words fail because this is a mystery at the edge of our time and our Father's eternity, but this is my point. We think that we are one, and God is two. So we look to the cross and we think God's divided, right? Between the mean God and the nice God. Between this thing we call justice and this other thing that we call love. That's common sense. The mystery is that God is one and each of us is two. And yet he's making us one in him. For in the garden Jesus prayed this prayer. The glory that you've given me I have given to them. That they may be one even as I, we are one. I in them and you in me. That's all of us. Undivided. Now I know, I know that your head hurts at this point. But, but just look at the picture that God has painted. Okay, in the Bible, God paints this picture. You see, when we take knowledge of God to make ourselves God, or like God, that's evil. But when God gives himself body broken and blood shed in order to make us like himself. What is that? Well, that's the good. And that's life. That's the mystery of good and evil and how the good conquers the evil. Colossians 1, 2, 4, 3. That's the mystery of Christ. Co common sense tells you that life is the survival of the fittest, right? The mystery is that life is the sacrifice of the fittest. <laughs> the mystery of Christ. When one person loves in a world that doesn't love, you've heard me say this over and over again, it looks like this. But when every person loves, all persons become one body. The body of Christ rising from the tomb, having been made in the image and likeness of God. In the garden where he was crucified, there was a tomb, and he came out of that tomb. So look at this picture that God has painted. Is this the worst thing that has ever happened? Or is this the best thing that has ever happened? If this is simply your choice, if this is simply your choice, you're a bastard. And you're going to hell. And this is the worst thing that ever, ever could have happened. But if this is God's choice, this is the revelation of what is in a world of what is not, and this is absolutely the best thing that ever, 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 ever could happen and does happen. This is love. And this is the eternal judgment of God. This is mercy. God consigned all to disobedience that it might have this, might have mercy on all. This means that you're not being tested to see what you will do. As if God didn't know what you would do. As if you were writing your own story. You are not being tested to see what you will do. You're being tested that you might see what God does do and will do. And is always done. No matter how he may be tempted or tested by you. You were led into temptation. Consigned to disobedience. That you might put God to the test and watch him pass the test in Jesus the Christ. That you might see that although we have been divided, he remains undivided. <laughs> 
In other words, he remains faithful. He remains love. He remains faithful love. The Old Testament word hased. That we might see that God our Father is relentless love. That you might justify his judgment in the words of Paul and David. That you might look at him and say, oh, that is an amazing judgment. That you might look to the tree and say, Abba, Dad, that you might have faith. Common sense will tell you that faith is your judgment, but the mystery is that faith is the judgment of God in you. The hypostasis, <laughs> the substance of things hoped for. 1 Timothy 3, 9, the mystery of the faith. Colossians 1, 26 through 27, the mystery hidden for ages and generations. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Matthew 13, Jesus says this to his disciples. He also says it in Mark and Luke, but in Matthew 13, says it this way. To you it has been given to know the mysteries, this is the time he uses it, of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For to him who has will more be given, but to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. If what you have is actually what you have not, then what you have is evil. <laughs> so guess that is like profoundly good news that it would be taken away. And how is evil taken away except by the eternal seed, which is faith, hope, and love sown in the soil of this earth at a tree in, in a garden. It was there that he lifted his head and cried, Father, forgive them, and delivered up his spirit, the spirit that's been planted in you as imperishable seed. So common sense will tell you that you're a bastard. The mystery is that the man on the tree is your dad. And the man on the tree is also his son, and the man on the tree is you. Romans 8, 15. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, that's inheritors, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I've given the glory to them, said Jesus. When I started this series 17 months ago, I titled the series Say Abba because of Romans 8.15. And then I planned to preach my favorite sermon to sum it all up. But as God would have it, during COVID, our guest preacher Carl got sick, called me by Green Mountain as I was on the way to church an hour before a sermon, the sermon started. And so I, I preached the sermon, my favorite sermon, and told one of my favorite stories, which was good because it set the stage for the rest of, of Romans. But I want to tell it again because I think it reveals the greatest mystery and how the mystery changes the world. It's a story that Fred Craddock heard from an old man, it's told him by an old man when he didn't want to be bothered, one day toward the end of his vacation in the great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, was sitting in the Blackberry Inn, a cafe called the Blackberry Inn, with his wife looking at the menu, when this old guy walked in the restaurant and started going around talking to everybody, and he just thought to himself, oh God, please don't let him talk to me. But sure enough, he meandered over to their table, and he said, hey! You folks new in town? Fred said, uh, yeah, yeah. Are you on vacation? He said, well, yeah, we, we are on vacation. You going to be here long? He said, no, no, we're, we're not going to be here long. And, and then he said the question. He asked the question that Fred had been waiting for. He said, so what do you do? Fred was asking for that question because he knew an answer that would shut him down. He said, well, I'm a homiletics professor. Uh, at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. And the old guy just lit up and he said, well, you're a preacher man, and I got a preacher story for you. And so he pulled up a chair and sat down. He said, I was born back in these mountains. 
my mama wasn't married. Things were different back in my day, but that was a problem. The other women, they used to just spend their time guessing as to who my daddy was. And I didn't know who my daddy was. My mama, my mama, she, uh, she worked a lot. She worked a lot, so I spent a lot of time alone. And the other kids, they weren't allowed to play with a boy like me. I'd hide in the weeds at recess, and I always ate my lunch alone. The kids used to call me Ben the Bastard Boy. Ben the Bastard Boy, Ben the Bastard Boy. I thought that Bastard Boy was my last name. And by this time, the old man had just started weeping. So he kind of gathered himself, pulled him back together, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What I was fixing to tell you was that there was this church nearby in Laurel Springs with this preacher. And he had a voice just big like, like God. I knew church wasn't a place for boys like me. But sometimes I'd sneak in and I'd sit toward the back and then, you know, I'd sneak out right before the service was over. But this one day, the preacher was just going on and it was glorious and I just got all caught up in what he was saying. And then before I knew it, the service was over. The aisle started to bunch up. People were jammed in the aisle. I was trying to get out. I was making my way back to the door quick as I could when all at once I felt this big hand on my shoulder. Whoop! And I heard the voice. Boy! Was the preacher man. I froze. He said, boy! He said it so loud that everybody was looking. They were all looking at me. He said, boy! Who's your daddy? The old man said, it was like a knife that just went right through my heart. And then real loud so everybody could hear, he said, boy, I know who your daddy is. Let's see now. Why, you're a, you're a child of, you're a child of, let's see now, you're a child of. And the old man said, he paused for this long time, seemed like forever, felt like judgment day. And then he said, why, why you're a child of, I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. And I see a striking resemblance. And then he patted me on the bottom and he said, now you run along and you claim your inheritance. And at that, the old man smiled, and he just stood up and walked out of the cafe. The waitress came scurrying over to the table, said, what did he say, what did he say, what did he say? And Fred looked at the waitress and said, well, um, he, he told me a story. Why'd you ask? She said, well, don't you know who that is? Don't you know who that is? And Fred said, no, I don't know who that is. She said, well, that's Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper, the illegitimate boy, elected twice the governor of Tennessee. You see, I think that's what Paul is saying to the Romans. I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. I think that's what I'm supposed to say to you. I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. I think that's what we're supposed to be saying to the whole world. I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. You don't choose your daddy. He's already chosen you. He subjected creation to futility, consigned all the disobedience so that you would see him have mercy on you and mercy on all, and then freely choose him as he has always chosen you. The mystery is Christ in you and all in Christ. Ephesians 1.10, the mystery of his will to unite, to unite all things in him, in Christ, his plan for the fullness of time. So stop hiding in the weeds. Stop eating your lunch all alone. It's time to run along and claim your inheritance, all things undivided and filled with love. The greatest mystery is that you can and you will say, Abba, Dad, For on the night that all of us were unfaithful, he remained 
absolutely faithful. And so he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is not common sense. And yet this maybe is common, uncommon sense. <laughs> I mean the kind that little kids have. This is faith, hope, and love. The imperishable seed. So, receive it and say, Abba. You see, I think that's what your father has been waiting ages and ages and ages to hear. Amen? And because, Lord God, you are holy... We can say, Abba. We can believe the simple gospel. Jesus, Yahweh is salvation. Because Yahweh's salvation has descended into us. <laughs> and we are yours, Lord God. And one day we'll see it. All thy works... Just like the psalm says. Just like it says right there at the start of Genesis. All thy works will praise your name. Thank you that that will happen. Because it has already happened. It is always happening. And soon we will see it happen. Because you will wake us from our sleep. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. All thy works shall praise thy name. But what around, what about like around eight o'clock this evening? <laughs> Do you think that all the Philadelphia Eagles will praise his name and all the Kansas City Chiefs will praise his name? I mean, so just imagine, just imagine what if, what if God is so good and so great that we fought the fight, we went to battle, we got to the end of time, and we discovered that everybody wins. Yeah, yeah do you think, do you think it could be that great? Do you think you could be that amazing? Yeah, may, may, maybe, maybe. Maybe. Because what if the thing that we were battling all along was evil? And so we conquered the darkness with light, the lies with the truth, the evil with the good. What if we conquered division with communion? <laughs> what if we conquered what is with, or what is not with what is, or what is conquered, what is not even with us? You know, about 25 years ago when the Broncos went to the Super Bowl, I remember I, Coleman was three. We were driving right by my house, and, you know, all the hype was happening, and we were in the blue van, and I remember he was really, really quiet, and he, he looked at me and said, Dad? And I said, yeah. I said, I, I need to, I wanted to ask you a question. I said, okay, buddy, what is it? He said, are the Green Bay Papper, Packers evil? <laughs> yeah, I might have said yes. I might have said yes. But then I want to correct myself and I said, no, buddy. No, 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 no. You don't understand. They're not evil. And yet everybody I know is infected with evil. And yet we will all party when Satan is crushed under our feet. Our feet. Whose feet are these? Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. I mean, Paul knew that, right? So whose feet are these? Wow. That's an incredible mystery. 
But blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel and preach the gospel. Amen.